press on the button anyway. Uh, you're now going to find that a little icon will pop up in your screen and you've got to press allow. If you don't press allow, it will not be the end of the world. You will not break the internet, but it will stay on your screen a little bit like that fly stayed on Mike Pence's head throughout the presidential debate. So uh, I would advise you strongly uh, to click allow. Um, now, I, I'm going to just say a word about our new research theme, and then I will introduce our panelists just before they speak. Uh, a word about a research theme. Some of you might have come along thinking, I don't know what that is. Let's find out and others will be familiar with what, it, what language based area studies is. But just in case, um, we, we are studying the politics, society, languages and cultures of different areas. That can be uh, countries, continents, the globe, local areas. Uh, and we, we really, understand this in the most eclectic, eclectic way possible. We also have a, an ambition to try to uh, revive area studies. Area studies is really thriving in some parts of the world and not thriving in others. And one of the reasons we think the area studies isn't always universally thriving is that there are certain um, areas that fall between the cracks and we're trying to uh, fill those. So for instance, we're focusing on transnational phenomena. And that's one of the big problems in area studies is how do you de demarcate an area? Uh, how would you include transnational in that area? Also, we're very conscious of the fact that um, some of the methodologies that are used in area studies could be expanded. So alongside critical thinking, we're also trying to bring in creative, think uh, creative uh, thinking and creative methods. More generally, we're trying to bring together humanities and social science uh, methodologies and theories in order to get to the nitty gritty of subjects that others really are unable to do. And it's a basically not, not a criticism of political scientists, but um, very often political scientists will do cross, uh, cross national studies, uh, theory based studies and so on. We're trying to sometimes get to the heart of uh, of what's going on in particular areas and particular cultures, languages, and so on. So to, to get to the topic that we're talking today, we're also trying to think about decolonizing area studies, breaking down some of the disciplinary barriers and, and incorporating these new and innovative methods and theories. And we're doing so in relation to a whole series of areas, including uh, on focused on languages, multilingualism, uh, language learning, linguistics, but also in terms of movements, such as socio-political movements, ideological movements, non-governmental movements, and also more generally into in relation to transnational phenomena such as crisis and culture. And all of our speakers all come from a language background and all have had an impact through their research on organizations or societies. And that's another thing that brings us together. Now, I don't want to talk for any longer than that. Um, I do, however, uh, want to introduce my our first speaker, who is uh, Professor Claire Guerrara, who's a professor of French, also Dean of, uh, research, the, of Research Environment and Culture at Cardiff University. Now, Claire has a vast range of research interests across the school and beyond, but for the purposes of this research group, what we will say is that she does research on language learning and multilingualism in schools in, in, in Wales, and she's published research on mentoring and languages, uh, multi, as well as multilingualism and the new curriculum for Wales and on language activism. And now I think, Claire, you should be able to speak and I should be able to mute myself without anything else happening. And if that does happen, we'll put you on speaker view. Okay, so over to you, Claire. Many thanks, Gordon. I'm going to share a screen uh, of just one slide that I hope you'll be able to have a look at while I'm while I'm talking. Um, can you see that slide? Yeah, great. Okay, because this slide really um, is a, is at the base really of what I'm going to be talking about. So I'm going to begin with a bit of an overview of where I sit in area studies, um, a bit about my own profile as a scholar. Um, and also I'm going to focus on the research that has come out of my work on mentoring and languages. And I'll end with a reflection on how my work with mentoring and also language learning 
has enabled me to rethink my own practice as an academic because becoming more involved with social science methodologies, thinking through language learning in Wales has obliged a reflection on my own research practice. So I want to have these sort of self-reflective at the end. So just to begin with, so I'm certainly not conventionally located in area studies. Um, I think of it as quite a capacious term, as Gordon said, but in my academic um, trajectory, I link areas those with quite far flung places like the Middle East or the African subcontinent um, or China. So in my academic past, I would have seen it very much as a, as a research field about far flung, far flung places. And that certainly wouldn't have been connected with the work that I do either now or in the past. But as my research has changed, I've come to look at the language element of what I do and how I do it. The global language based area studies, I suppose moniker or field has really come to appeal to me more and to apply to me more as a researcher and an academic. Now I'm, I'm gonna give a brief overview of, of the language dimension um, of my work and how it operates. And I want to sort of talk about how what I've done within this field has led to what we might be calling action research. So I've, I've worked very much with languages here in Wales and in Spain and in England, and I felt very personally implicated in the work that I've undertaken, and it has changed my research modus operandi and how I've worked. And one of the really important things that's come out of my work um, under the global language based area studies theme is that I've become a more collaborative researcher. I work more across fields and across sectors. And I've come to champion the L in global language based area studies, the language element, and how it relates not to a far flung place, but to here in Wales. So in other words, how you can bring home that moniker and that field to work in Wales. So my profile as an academic then, so I'm, I am quite a traditional literary scholar. Um, I've worked on post-war French fiction, film and uh, graphic novels. Um, I, I work on French photography, I work on popular culture. I'm very much a French studies academic and a limite a cultural studies academic. So moving towards the language part of global language based area studies was really very much in response to the situation on the ground here in Wales. In other words, I did not um, uh, you know, predict, predetermine my interest in this area. My research developed as a result of the decline and uptake of a modern language in schools here in Wales. And it was really in response, in, I was in an urgency mode, in response to the decline here in Wales, that my research began to move into or bifurcate towards this area. So in 2015, um, when I began my work on language and mentoring, 22% of all young people in Wales chose a language at GCSE. Yeah? Um, and that's obviously an optional subject at 14. Now, in 2020, that figure is under 18%. So we've got less than a, well, less than a quarter of young people in Wales, less than a fifth, are choosing a language at GCSE, often a European language, French, German, or Spanish. And um, I think an even more depressing and dispiriting fact is that in 2020, i.e. in the year just gone, just 73 people in the whole of Wales did German A-level. So we're talking about some language parts, some language areas in Wales being in critical condition. In other words, in the next five years, it's, it's more than entirely possible that German will no longer be taught um, in very large parts of Wales. So we're in an urgency situation when it comes to language learning in Wales. And my research into this area really came as a result of being invited um, in 2015 by the Welsh Government to develop a mentoring project funded by Welsh Government. And the aim was to train undergraduate students, in this case modern language students, to go into schools to act as mentors to young people aged 12 to 14 to persuade, convince and educate them about the benefits of doing a language at GCSE. The project's now its sixth year and actually we began with working with 27 secondary schools in Wales, We've now worked with over 100 schools in Wales out of 200. So we, we've worked with, almost, with over half, almost half of the secondary school sector in Wales, sending in undergraduate students to support uh, that choice of the language at GCSE. And we collaborate with Swansea, Aberystwyth and Bangor universities as well. It's really uh, an inter-university project. Now, of course, the project began as a schools engagement project. It had no research aspirations. Um, but as the project has progressed and as new colleagues have joined the programme and joined the MFL mentoring team, research and scholarship, and I, I see this as very much a frayed edge between scholarship and research. To me, they're not in opposing areas. They're very much interconnected. Uh, those uh, ambitions began to develop. And it's certainly morphed into a project with quite a high, now high productivity in terms of research and scholarship output. So today we've published two research articles, one in the curriculum journal aimed at the teaching education profession, 
and we're in the World Journal of Education, which is obviously clearly focused at the world sector. We've written two policy reports, one for Welsh Government and one for an AHRC Open World Research Initiative project. I've produced two opinion pieces in the conversation on linguophobia and Brexit and mentoring and languages. And I'm, I'm just producing a chapter now on language activism for a book um, based around um, language acts and world making. And my colleagues in the MFL Mentoring Project have also produced Lucy Jenkins' uh, short articles for the Scottish Language Review, and they have items forthcoming in mean, a journal in a journal linked to issues in English. So very much a collaborative project. Almost every piece is co-written and co-produced, and we work very much across education, languages, and more broadly across the sector. The question might be, how is all of this global language based area studies? Well, I'd say for three reasons it is in this category or it's in this area. First of all, because this whole project and its research advocates for research understanding of how language learning is in decline, and how we can how we can address that. We worked in partnership with the Castilla y Leon region of Spain um, between 2018 and 2020. We worked to support bilingual education. We worked with a number of small um, primary schools to promote their bilingual Spanish English stream into secondary school. So we worked very much with, with, with the language learning in context across the UK and into Spain. So for me, it's that element, that language element has really been very much the fore in our working practice. Secondly, I've definitely um, learned enormous amounts and begun to apply creative research methods. I've got to absolutely acknowledge the support and the learning I've had from my PhD students, Helen Arfon, who's here on, on the call today, and Ira Jepson, as well as my colleagues Lucy Jenkins and Tulu McKean Fuelin. All of these colleagues have been extraordinarily important mentors to me for learning about and applying creative research methods. And this means working with young people on the ground in schools, co-producing them. Um, teaching materials, working with the teacher profession to think about devising um, language learning resources, and also providing um, language skills workshops have a creative research element dimension to them. And we're now working on a post-16 project, uh, what we call the Language Recovery Project, with A-level students going forward to academic session. And it's all based on creative research methods, where research methods inform uh, the pedagogical practice of that work. So that's been really key for my development. And thirdly, it's global language based because it's very much transnational. And by that, I mean between England and Wales, because colleagues, if you will believe, you won't believe how very diverse education is in England and Wales. We are working in a transnational frame where the UK obviously is for four nations, but there's a very much a devolved approach to education, and it really is a transnational project. We have worked with the Department for Education on their language development in schools in Sheffield and then in the Midlands, and we've definitely worked very much with the Welsh Government on the new curriculum for Wales. So it is looking at language practice, sharing good practice across England and Wales in ways that are very much transnational. And as part of the project, this transnational project, I've learned not to take the word language for granted, not to assume that English is the default language of practice. And I've learned to deprioritize English. I mean, we're living here in a bilingual nation with very strong multilingual ambitions. And I have learned very much to challenge what David Grambling calls the monolingual paradigm of English versus modern foreign languages. For me, there's no M, there's no F, there's just L. So I don't use the word modern foreign language, I use the word languages. And I mean that's to include all languages in a really strong support for linguistic diversity. And again, our former colleague, Loriana Poletzi, again, helped me think through this question of linguistic diversity. We may be speaking English now, we go to French or Welsh or Spanish later on, but absolutely we have to move away from seeing English as the default neutral language, it's not neutral. It is a highly colonialized language. And if we only live, think and study through English, we deprive ourselves of much rich heritage and developments. So to conclude then, what have I learned as a researcher for moving into and thinking about uh, the language element of my work? I've learned three things. One, I've learned to rethink myself as a primary investigator. I've moved away from the word primary now. Everything is co-produced, co-written, co-developed. And I've tried to de 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 hierarchize or you know, deprioritize the, the academy's pyramid of values, which bases the lone scholar as, the, as the, the only research producer. So we're a community of research producers, and I'm trying to, as it were, sort of deprioritize that lone scholar model. I've learned to think collaboratively away from primary to collective investigation. Secondly, I've, I've learned to acknowledge my own language journey. 
Uh, my own experience as a British person from an Anglo-Italian background, I've learned to not seem as a default language, to think about being a scholar working in a bilingual country and valuing that bilingualism. And thirdly, I've come to value impact, as Gordon said earlier on, of our research and our scholarship. I've, uh, impact for me is not a ref category. I know it is a ref category, but for me, it's much, much more than that. Impact is social mission. So I've learned to understand and value having impact on the ground as a primary outcome of research, not as a, not as, as it were, an, a, a tributary, you know, as, a, as an offshoot, as a primary outcome. And that lovely image you can see there on the screen now, that is um, a graphic visualization of what mentees um, thought about doing languages following a weekend workshop in Oxford with an MFL mentoring program. And that's what young person aged 14 got out of our work. It had positive impact, it raised their confidence, it encouraged them to think differently, it gave them a link to the world, and it gave them a sense of having someone in their corner. And very importantly, this project gives agency to kids. It allows children to acknowledge and value all of their languages, both in school and out, both Punjabi, Welsh, French, German, Arabic, and to see a language not as a classroom activity, but as a door that opens, and as, as a window onto other worlds. So for me, becoming um, a languages activist, a languages scholar in a global and transnational frame has given me a platform for change where research has meaning beyond ref outputs, but meaning as uh, somebody working with communities to make a difference and make things better. That's me done. Okay, well, thank you very much, Claire. That was excellent. Was, we've now moved to speaker view for some reason, but I think um, that, that has given us a lot of food for thought. And I think we will ask questions at the end. Um, so thank you so much. I'm now going to introduce the second speaker who is, I'll, um, I'll, I'll leave it on uh, speaker view just in case, uh, who is Andrew Dowling, who hopefully will come up on the screen in a second. And Andrew, you will have to unmute yourself in a second. Andrew Dowling is a contemporary historian at uh, Cardiff University, formerly at uh, Queen Mary's University. His expertise is in Catalan history in the 20th century under uh, Franco, but also more recently in uh, the focusing particularly on the pro-independence mobilization in Catalonia. Uh, Andrew's produced excellent research uh, on, on all of these topics, including uh, monographs of various kinds and engaging very heavily with the media. I mean, you're never off the media from what I can gather, which is great. So I'm going to uh, try to let you take over here and let's see if we go into speaker view this time, uh, unless you're sharing your screen. So uh, over to you, Andrew. Okay, um, thanks very much for Gordon for that uh, very kind introduction. Um, I'm gonna take things in a very different way from from Claire, um, we, but hopefully, I think as we proceed, we'll see that there there are also clear parallels and similarities, and and more importantly, linkages. What I'm going to say. The first thing what I wanted to do really is um, give an overview of area studies as a discipline, as how it's developed, and particularly how it's developed since the 1990s, and where it currently stands, and, and if you want where it's currently going. The first thing that perhaps not everybody may know is, is that the real origin of um, area studies lies in the Cold War. And it emerged amongst both sides of the Cold War, amongst the, the capitalist powers and amongst the communist powers. And it, it was really very much a need on both sides of the Cold War to kind of comprehend, to understand their political enemy, their political rival. So we see in, in its early phases, you know, from the late 1940s onwards, um, a profound search for insight and country and area and local knowledge to provide as much depth knowledge into the power that they, that they believed was in danger of overthrowing them or removing them or conquering them. So it had very much a, a, a kind of character area studies as very closely connected in terms of a very clear development on both sides of, if you want, the Berlin Wall or both sides of the Iron Curtain, a close connection between universities and security services. So academics worked closely in the case of the United States of America with the CIA, in the case of the Soviet Union with the KGB, 
And we even saw similar processes existing, for example, in the UK, where Oxbridge very much functioned as a recruitment ground for the classic Cold War spy. And they, they these people were recruited, of course, because they supposedly had, hopefully had, strong linguistic and political knowledge of their country of study, of their area of study. So that's the development of area studies for essentially until the end of the Cold War. With the end of the Cold War, um, area studies enters a period of major transformation, major change. We see the decline and almost the collapse of the traditional discipline, particularly that existed in the United States of America, which we could call communist studies. There is an attempt to continue post-communist studies, but it gradually fades and, and has very little traction. So the post-Cold War period, particularly after 1991, represents a new development in the discipline. And we see increasing prioritization of development. Development becomes a primary focus of the area studies discipline that exists for quite a period of time, particularly over the course of the 1990s. It also coincides with um, a, a kind of rhetoric, a kind of discourse around globalization that's apparently evident. So there's a big focus on economic or political development in this phase. So traditional boundaries then um, of area studies seem to collapse with this new focus on economic and political development. And in one sense, area studies almost ended up disappearing, partly disappearing as it seemed to merge as an academic discipline within into either international relations or international studies. And it seemed that the traditional category of area studies seemed to be fading from view. However, from the early 2000s, uh, we begin to see a revival in what we can call the traditional focus of area studies, as, as has been outlined by both our speakers, which is deep and profound country or area-based knowledge provided by um, linguistic insight, okay? And I, I wanna you know, reiterate this linguistic point. So for example, we get American foreign policy disasters at the turn of the, at the, turn of the new century. We have things like the financing of the Taliban and then subsequent e experience of blowback after 9-11. And I think above all, the catastrophe of the Iraq war. The Iraq war as, as, a, as, a, as an almost role model of how not to do things where hundreds of supposed advisors were sent out to Iraq to implement policy on implement policies. And in the vast majority of the cases, these supposed advisors had no language knowledge, had no historical knowledge of Iraq, knew nothing about the culture of the country and little or nothing about the religious divisions. So there was a gradual rethink after that catastrophically catastrophic policy of the Iraq war. And we gradually see uh, in the late, uh, towards the end of the first decade of the 21st century, a, a gradual revival in the importance of area studies. And we see that the funding cuts that had been applied over the course of the 1990s and the early 2000s are gradually being reversed. Then of course, um, the rise and rivalry with China is producing an accelerating need for country knowledge. And I think here we can see important parallels, particularly under the new regime of Xi Jinping, that Sinology, the, the study and analysis of China, increasingly becomes the Krem Kremlinology of the Kremlinology of the 21st century, because we are now engaged in a heavily controlled, heavily policed, heavily censored society. So it's often um, you know, negotiating or trying to comprehend the runes of the occasional um, comments or observation made in a heavily controlled media. Um, framework. Next important element, I think, um, that contributes to the revival of area studies as, as a discipline, as an area, is the, the gradual demolition by around 2010 of the rhetoric of the end of history. After the end of the Cold War, of course, there's, the, there's, a, there's a period of time where the United States and its allies um, strongly believing that they've won the Cold War and that everywhere is eventually going to converge with the Western model of liberal democracy. But a series of ruptures and body blows begin to ch challenge this narrative. So for example, from the, the emergence of ISIS um, begins to 
seriously question that, to the Arab Spring and, and their aftermath in 2011, the differential impact of the economic crisis after 2008, the emergence, for example, of leftist political responses in, in Spain and Greece, and in recent years, of course, the past decade has been particularly marked by the emergence of varying forms of rightist populism in a whole range of societies that really do require deep imbrication in the area or the country of the focus of study. So area studies has been through a whole series of changes and developments in recent years. And I will come now to, to where it's going in the last few years and where it's going to be going, if you want, in the next few um, years and decades. First thing to note, of course, is that area studies is, is rather an unusual discipline where, for, on the one hand, um, colleagues or participants in this discipline will likely be members of some kind of regional or area association, the Latin American Studies Association or the Middle East Studies Association, etc. But in methodological terms, they're often very plural as scholars and they contribute to scholarly debates and intellectual progress rather across a range of disciplines and some disciplines. And I think this is much more than rhetorical interdisciplinarity. For, for many years in academia, interdisciplinarity has, has been the supposed buzzword, but I think perhaps area studies or people working in comparative politics or comparative social anthropology or, or historical sociology, et cetera, um, really are engaged in this area, okay? So the, the, the echoing what's already been said, then the strength of area studies is firstly in the linguistic terrain. Um, experts in the country or region or area of study have often lived in the country. They have a deep linguistic knowledge. And I think providing that they don't, do not go native uh, in terms of their embrace of the cultural region of which they study, I think their, um, their lived experience and their linguistic experience can provide um, incredibly enriching insights. So area studies straddles areas, countries, regions, and it straddles academic disciplines. I think where area studies is going and where it's shifting and where we can trace its emergence in recent years is the appearance of what is now increasingly called comparative area studies. So this is perhaps an inevitable trend given that capital or the capitalist system continues its expansion across the globe, leaving very few spaces untouched by its sweep. In a sense, if capitalism is everywhere, apart from perhaps North Korea, what remains? What is there left to study? What should we be studying? And I think what the, uh, what the contribution of, of comparative area studies is also bringing to the table an um, increasing sense that societies are not static and not unchanging. And I'd say that this in particular differentiates um, area studies as we would understand it in the 21st century from the model of the Cold War, which very much tended to see societies as static and unchanging. Now we're much more likely to see the fluidity and the change and the transformations being on in these societies. So what, so what does comparative area studies do? Well, it seeks to give balance to regional region and to context using the comparative method to achieve link causal links. So it's the continuation of the old form of area studies as in a deep linguistic and in, in deep linguistic insight and knowledge of the country of study. But linkage with either through the individual, through uh, the learning of new other languages, or perhaps even more importantly, and perhaps of more relevance, is the grouping of small groups of researchers pooling their in-depth individual area or regional knowledge to seek comparative in outcomes or comparative insights. And I think this shift, this change in um, com that comparative area studies is providing reminds us of, of really of the old point that context matters and it's much more than mere description and, and the, the emergence of this comparison can only enrich the disciplines whether of the individual or whether in the global regional area. 
So one of the things the comparative area studies in particular does then through through what we can call contextualized comparison, it explains two very important processes that I think are going to be increasingly the focus for the next few years. And I'd use these two terms, divergence and convergence. Divergence and convergence, I think, is going to be one of the areas of, of, of pattern making or or pattern analysis that we're going to see increasingly appear. I mentioned, for example, just a, you know, a few minutes ago about how capitalism is increasingly all conquering. But what, what is the actual impact of it in an individual society with its own cultural, religious and political histories? For example, you know, taking from my own work, um, we know that, for example, in, in recent years or in the past 10 years, we've seen important pro-independence movements emerge at broadly similar times in societies like Quebec, Scotland and Catalonia. So there must be a pattern. There must be, mustn't there? I suppose it is one sense. And certainly we can find individual explanations of the salience of each case, but we can also, by using comparative insight, and this could include, for example, the examination of changing class structure in those three societies where I think in, in, in Scotland, Catalonia and Quebec, we see in particular middle class sectors are increasingly engaging in political protest. And that, in my view, is very much linked to how their own economic circumstances are increasingly pressured. In the case of workers, and, we, and again, broadly defined, um, the experience of economic security for the workers or the, the, the formerly industrial working class and however you want to define them today, I think their experience of economic um, insecurity has been a constant since the late 1970s. It's almost a permanent feature of their existence, but it has not been a permanent or a constant feature of the existence of the middle classes until very much the past decade. So, so how can we use, for example, that comparative insight into changes in class identification or changes in the class structure to provide perhaps some insights across three different regions, areas, countries, whatever you want to call them. So what comparative area studies does then, I think, is it asks general questions that, that have relevance on cases from different areas. And it, it invites comparison that engages scholarly discourse within area studies communities, but also, I think more importantly, beyond area studies communities. And Again, I, I do want to reiterate um, the point that has been made by the first speaker as well, that it is the actual, the training of the area studies specialist, in particular that linguistic training that provides the starting point for their ability to build and provide ever greater insight. Again, I'm happy to perhaps consider this in terms of the debate then. Comparative area studies then requires us to think about context, sensitivity to context, establishing causal linkages. And just a final point, perhaps we can call it family resemblances and family differences. The family can unite, but the family can divide. Um, I mentioned earlier um, the emergence of right wing populism. So just as, as, a, as a kind of like final point, we consider in, over the past 10 years, we've certainly seen the emergence of, uh, of rightist or nativist populism in countries like the Philippines, Brazil, the United States of America, Italy, Hungary and Turkey. What does that tell us about those respective societies that we seem to be seeing similar political expression going on in, in societies in which I think we pretty much all agree there are major internal differences there are major internal differentiations and a final perhaps observation of how we can best use um, comparative area studies might be thinking about um, post-imperial trajectories for example examining the development comparatively of say India and Pakistan their experience since the departure of the British and their own parallel development as two societies perhaps would, you know Obviously, incredible linguistic skills would be need, but again, that's um, an opportunity to seek out collaboration amongst different scholars who have their own deeply linguistic-based cultural and, ling and cultural and political insight that only um, the area or the the insight provided in the area can provide. 
So I will leave it there and over and out. Thank you. Many thanks, uh, Andrew. That was a very comprehensive uh, talk which overlaps um, with many of the concepts in the first talk and also uh, brings in many new ideas for discussion. Just before introducing Joey, I, I wanted to say that uh, we're beginning to get a couple of questions in the q and it, It's in your interest to put the questions in the Q&A because the order in which they come will be the order in which we ask them. So please, if you are sitting on a question, please do write it in the Q&A and we will come to it at the end. Now I'm going to introduce Joey Whitfield, Dr. Joey Whitfield, uh, who is who has come to us from Leeds University, um, uh, a brilliant uh, young, I think it's fair for me to say young scholar who has published very widely, uh, who works on 20th and 21st century Latin American literature and film. Uh, his first book was a study of Latin American prison writing, and he's also, uh, I think, published a book on the war on drugs, or is about to. So Still haven't. You haven't. Well, he's working on uh, uh, that. So watch this space. Uh, although with the pandemic, it might be quite a long wait. Who knows? Um, and what I would say, uh, perhaps more directly linked to area studies, um, you have also done a lot of work with prisons in the UK as well, and you've unlocked, uh, you've, you've co-edited a, a collection of writing by men imprisoned in HMP Nottingham, I believe, and you also uh, run an incredibly innovative course called Inside Out, which, uh, you know, you can maybe tell us more about that in the Q&A or in your talk, but I will leave it over to you now and I will mute myself, Joey. Okay. Oh, thanks very much, Gordon. Um, and thanks, Claire and Andrew. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so apologies. I've got a bit. I've got a horrible cold, so I'm sniffling a lot, and also my internet dropped out before. So um, I don't know. Hope, hopefully, I'll get through this. But um, so I wanted to address well some of the things Gordon already mentioned. I'm going to talk a little bit about my research and, and current projects. But I wanted to uh, sort of address a question which I suppose preoccupies me quite a lot, which is whether it is possible to do area studies in a sort of decolonial or at least a manner or in a way that doesn't sort of perpetuate um, the power hierarchies that are sort of in some ways inherent within it. Um, Andrew touched on that a little bit. And I think in my area, which is Latin American studies, um, that Cold War logic that he was mentioning sort of got superimposed onto the idea of Latin America as a region, which was already kind of always a, the product of a colonial and imperial perspective. So that the, the very notion of Latin America as a as coherent um, region was invented by Napoleon when he wanted to conquer the region. And so he was trying to sort of um, create a link between, you know, France and the, the Spanish speaking countries. So, um, so, you know, in some ways, it's, I think it's sort of an, well, I'm, well, no, I, I went back. Uh, yeah, it, it is sort of an inherently um, impossible question, but I'm going to talk. So, and in kind of getting to this point, I, I returned, when well, pre preparing, I returned to this essay called um, Chichin Akach Ukchiwa, A Reflection on the Practices and Discourses of de Decolonization by the um, Bolivian Aymara philosopher Silvia Rivera Cusicanqui. Um, and Cusicanqui is, I don't know if anyone's heard of her, she's sort of um, Kind of deserves to be a lot more famous um, and she was talking about decolonization and the need to um, think in these terms way back in the 1980s um, and is still going today she's in her 70s now um, and in this essay which is from 2010 um, she reflects on the way in which um, universities in the global north have sort of taken up discourses of decolonization um, and sort of appropriated them in ways that are, are, that she's very, very critical of. Um, and she says that universities in the global north which try to engage with the global south are pyramids without bases, she says, um, and criticizes even sort of practices of like bringing scholars from the global south to the global north to conferences and giving them scholarships and things as forms of patronage that does sort of nothing to disturb the colonial structure of which, um, which is sort of inherent in the idea of us from the global north studying these these regions um, with this kind of developmentalist sort of perspective that Andrew was talking about. 
Um, and yeah, so I guess, um, yeah, she, I mean, I don't know if I have time, but another thing in that essay, which I really recommend is that she sort of talks about this Aymara conception of time. Aymara is a large indigenous group from Bolivia. Um, and she sort of talks about how we should try to think in thinking decolonially, we, it helps to think about their conception of time, which is a sort of more cyclical and more um, and less linear mode of thinking about time, in which past and present um, or past and, and future are less separate than how we would think about them. So, you know, the sort of past, imperial pasts and the colonial pasts, which is sort of still present in, in, in the present and will still be present in the future. But also um, she sort of suggests that as scholars, we need to be thinking about ourselves as connected to the past and also, you know, projecting into the future and having an impact on that future. Um, so, yeah, while, you know, according to Kusi Kanki, there's sort of almost no way that I, as a sort of um, scholar in a university in the global north, even albeit one in England's first and final colony, could really, you know, be fully decolonial. Um, uh, there are a few things she says that sort of, that have kind of informed the way that I've tried to go about things. So she says, can decolonization be just a way of thought or a form of discourse and answers that there can be no discourse of decolonization, no theory of decolonization without a decolonizing practice. Um, and so this idea that it is kind of practice and action that should precede theory um, has certainly resonated with me and with the various projects that I've done. So as Gordon, um, and yeah, in the time that remains, I'm going to just speak briefly about um, the one that I'm doing at the moment and, and the ways in which I've tried to make it, tried to do it in a way that is at least, if not decolonial, sort of uh, disturbs those power hierarchies that Claire was also talking about. Um, so, yeah, um, so working on prisons, prisons are, of course, a, a, a totally transnational phenomenon um, and a very colonial phenomenon, and they're very similar, more or less, the world over. Um, you know, lots of other, we'll yeah, go into the history of that, but I don't really have time. Um, but yeah, so what we did um, with this project was we got some money, which is from the AHRC, which is impact money. Um, and we tried to sort of invert the, the usual order of things by having our project, by getting these project partners who are activist groups who work in prisons in Mexico um, and do sort of, in cult, um, well, they do publishing um, projects with imprisoned people there. Um, there's two collectives. One is a feminist collective called the Sisters in the Shadow, and the others are um, these sort of anarchists who make books out of cardboard and teach people to make their own books. So what we did was we basically went to them and you know, we've done work sort of on them in the past and got to know them and become friends with them. But we went to them and said, you know, what would you like to do if you had some money? And we sort of allowed them to really design the project, although we kind of made it more or less try to guide it so that it would more or less fit within something that was acceptable to the HRC as well. Um, so yeah, but rather than co-design, I mean, really, they did come up with the entire thing and we've just sort of ended up funding it and kind of acting as administrators for it. Um, and, um, and yeah, they both came up with very different kind of action, action projects, which both involve um, continuing to work in prisons. And what we wanted to do and what COVID has completely uh, ruined was that they were supposed to come over to the, to the UK and do a series of training workshops and train um people including us and some other activists we know here to uh, basically use their methodologies to take them into uk prisons which is something which i don't know if it's going to be possible at all but we hope that it might be um and yeah i mean the project is ongoing they're halfway through their um their work and actually in mexico despite the higher rates of covid things haven't shut down as much so they've been able to um more or less carry on although um, the feminist collective have turned their project made their project entirely online so it's become a sort of tech empowerment project as well um, and yeah i guess the thing about the way we've ended up working with them um, has working with them has 
or as sort of equal partners or really more than equal partners it feels like um it's very been very time consuming um and sort of negotiating the relationships and the power dynamics has take has been quite messy at times um because we've been sort of quite unwilling to impose anything on them but that has occasionally led to them uh, to sort of uh, well various issues that maybe talk about in the q and a um and yeah i mean and i think that that sort of the difficulty of it has been come from the fact that kind of ceding power and control while also keeping AHRC happy is a bit of a challenge. Um, it remains to be seen how successful it all is. Um, and yeah, I would say, you know, um, despite the fact that we are doing basically what our um, collaborators wanted, um, well, you know, what they designed, the we haven't really disturbed the hierarchy overall because the the way the funding works for the AHRC, the the amount that we've actually given them is is very very small compared to what you know Cardiff University actually takes, um, which you know um, so we kind of can't really talk to them about the overall budget because it would just it would just it would just be crazy. So that's um, yeah. So that's sort of I think that's all I have to say really. <laughs> I've given maybe enough detail, but um, but yeah, people can ask further questions if they're interested. Well, many thanks, Julie. Thank you very much. And I can see that you are being very politically savvy in your recounting of that story, and very careful in your uh, choice of words. And I think that's that's good because we are recording this session. And and I, I, I think that's another really incredibly interesting uh, perspective that we've got. And I think if it's if it's OK, we'll, we'll open up to the questions uh, from the Q&A and then and that will basically involve us reading out the questions and a uh, panelists or either individual panelists answering or all panelists having a chance to answer and once we've got through the questions which are written then we'll open up to live questions um let me see shall i read the first question and then elena you read the second question we haven't got that many so uh, we have a question uh, people have been a bit wary of asking questions so uh, please do ask a question you know the first question for, from chris is to clear and it says is one of the challenges get, uh, given the focus of this group to increase greater teaching about countries using French, comma, German, et cetera, at times at schools rather than focus on languages. Many teenagers, based on discussions with my children and their friends, have issues with language due to the perception of it being hard to get an A star and the poor quality of teaching rather, uh, rather than any issues with the language learning itself. Perhaps more work about the country rather than the language would aid in seeing its relevance and help raise marks. Claire, do you want to take that question? Yeah, no, no thanks so much for that question, Chris. And I, I couldn't agree more. And one of the ways in which I'm working with my colleagues in an activist mode is to try and impact on the uh, Department for Education and also the Welsh Government in how they go about teaching languages. We do, we are in a in quite a bifurcated time in the sense of there are very powerful interest groups who have a very strong focus on grammar, phonics, vocabulary. And there is a small but specific group, and I think I put myself amongst those, who are really much more engaged by the sort of cultural, intercultural communication element of language teaching and who are pushing very strongly for a more culturally focused component and or ethos to language teaching. So I, I would be, I'm, 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 I'm asking Welsh Government to create with the new Welsh curriculum, I'm asking the qualifications board, WJEC, to educate us in multilingualism. And I actually think that there should be, we should be focusing on developing the metalinguistic skills that students use to develop language learning, rather than focusing on how many words they can recite in French in an exam when they're 16. So I, I couldn't agree with you more. I think it's it's trying to inspire and fire that love of languages and the cultures from which they emerge, but also try and reward young people who have great language learning capacity, but necessarily focused on what I might consider the more uh, conventional and more um, formulaic elements of, of the learning of it. So I, I'm really not for fluency. I think fluency is an overrated uh, um, outcome. I think it's about intercultural communication, curiosity, um, tolerance, and also you know communication in a very, very broad sense. I couldn't agree more. I think when we do go into schools and, and use our creative research methods and promote um, a languages for all 
vision. We don't, we don't promote any particular language. We teach a bit of Japanese, Arabic, French, German. We'd go for all languages. Students are very enthused by that. I think they feel a really, really pigeonhole and siloed into their French class or their Spanish class. So I think you know, the way forward is a much more multilingual approach that's more culturally focused and that is less obsessed by fluency and more interested in confidence in communication. Many thanks, Claire. Uh, Elena, do you want to ask the second question from Chris? And we've got four questions in total, so I think we can take them all. Uh, Elena, do you want yeah. to ask that second um, question? The next question from uh, Christopher Hood to Andrew is whether Japanese studies is unusual in that it has been a long running area studies field, often with its own distinct schools, departments in universities for teaching and research, particularly after the establishment of Sheffield in, in the 1960s and the Cardiff and then Cardiff and many others in the 80s. Okay, thanks very much, Chris. I suppose that there are, there are kind of two elements, I would think, to that question. The first one is obviously how the discipline is taught within the university sector. And I'm, I'm sure you will recall that there was discussion in the, in the creation of our school about um, um, merge, if you want, including, um, for example, Japanese and Chinese studies within East Asian studies, but that didn't come to pass. So I suppose that in one sense, there's the question of how should Japanese studies be best presented, best um, offered in the UK? And I suppose then what I was trying to get at um, in terms of what I was having to say is how, how should we think about Japanese studies as an example of an area studies discipline, as you know, you, you make all those very valid points about it as an academic um, discipline that it is, you know, is Japan like the UK? Is it an island story? Is there, is there nothing that can, uh, I don't know much obviously about the internal development of Japanese studies within Japanese universities, but is there is there, a, is there an increasing sense of comparative study examining, you know, comparisons with Korea and Japan? Is that is that something that's happening in, in Japanese universities? I don't know. If it isn't happening, why isn't it? Is it something that is happening in the UK? Could it happen? Should it happen? Um, is there useful insight to be derived from expanding the focus of Japanese studies to include societies in the surrounding area? So for me, um, in answering your question now, I think that the how, how we perceive the discipline and then how the discipline is presented within the UK university sector are strongly interconnected. and. I'm very happy to hear your thoughts if you're allowed to um, to speak, which I think you are. I don't know if you have to unmute Chris or not. Does he have speaking rights? Um, I think we're just going to go through the questions okay. right now, and then we're going to come, and then it's going to be a free for all after that. Okay, okay? no problem. Uh, but I think I'm going to read out Hannah's question, and then uh, then I think Elena, you'll read out Robert's question, and then we will open it up to Mike. Anybody speaking on the mic? So Hannah has asked a question of Joey, and says, "Joey, could you tell us more about the actual publishing projects on the ground in Mexico? You said they designed them. I'd be interested to learn more about what that means in practice, and are you confident that they would work here too?" Um. Well, you have to read. Yeah, so there, there's two different collectives with very different approaches. And it's really been fascinating to see how they have worked. And one of the things we did try to envisage at the beginning that hasn't worked so well was we were hoping that they would kind of collaborate with each other and learn from each other because they have very different strengths. So that the kind of anarchists who are the cardboard publishers, they um, produce, but they just go in and their model is to uh, collect, tell people they're coming in and they're going to publish whatever they've got and they publish it, um, they teach everyone to make books, everybody, you know, they'll do that, like, spend an afternoon and create a hundred books which are just made of cardboard and they will, well, they, I think they go in twice and then they, or three times maybe but, you know, after these three afternoons they have a print run of 100, 150 books and then they sell them for about you know, equivalent of about a dollar each and then um and they uh, and they're, they're so cheap and quick, they just do this over and over again. And they also uh, kind of having taught the people to make their books, they kind of um, support them to set up their own versions of the printing presses and sort of continue making them. So their vision is for it to be sort of self-sustaining and kind of rhizomatic. 
Um, and then the other group have a completely opposite uh, sort of approach and they're a feminist collective working in women's prisons and they spend months engaging really closely um, and doing a lot of kind of consciousness raising work um, and the books they produce take you know six months to a year to to create and edit and they're very careful and they're sort of um, politically very interesting and sort of ideologically informed and you know they the writing tends to be very you know, critical of you know patriarchy and have a very sort of intersectional um, conception of the justice system and, and so on and so forth um, but they their books are quite expensive and they don't uh, you know they we were sort of hoping that they would maybe uh, you know well so basically both groups um, had diff brought different skills and in the UK yeah I mean I think it would be sustainable certainly the the cardboard publishing um, what our plan was was to work with the art teachers in prisons here because they all have arts programs um, and it's the kind of thing that is very easy to teach and we've got um, art teachers on board in several um, well in six prisons who were going to work with us but it's we've had to completely change it because you can't not, you can't go into any UK prisons now um, and instead we are <laughs> producing a DVD <laughs> Um, and we're going to try and basically do it like a kind of distance learning module, but I have no idea whether it will work or not. But that's what, we're, what that's the only option we could come up with, which we developed working with the people I've known in Cardiff Prison and um, in the education department there. So it was kind of their their suggestion, but yeah, don't know if it'll, how it will go. Excellent. Elena, do you want to ask the other question? The fourth question we've yes. got? Yes. Um, Robert Pike asked a question for Claire. Uh, I taught French at secondary level for some time. Would you agree that the jump from GCSC to A level, as examinations currently stand, is too big for the less talented linguist who simply enjoys the subject and may well improve when a little bit older, more mature? How would, how could the sorry, how could the gap be bridged? Thank yeah, thanks, Robert. Um, yes, I'm actually. I, I'm, I'm sitting here now. My, my son is is doing um, is doing A level French and Welsh. Uh, so I, I, I'm sort of living it as a, as a family experience. And it did take him a long time to persuade him to do want to do French. Um, he, he had the choice of like French or chemistry, and lucky for him, he went for French. Um, he did four AS levels and, and then changed. And I and I, I've lived it because I think it is true. I think there is there are, there are pervasive stories that A level languages are more difficult. Um, I'm not saying that's not um, incorrect. Although I think we do have a smaller cohort. Um, of very um, probably very motivated young people doing A-level and the figures in terms of attainments are very good if you compare it to like A-level maths it's much higher um, percentage of, of those gaining A, A and A star top grades but I think there is a big leap I think I think the leap to look at long form fiction um, is very difficult for students who have done very 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 a little um, close working creatively with text and one of the things that, that we have found that we're promoting a lot is to try and move towards a much more creative approach to translation because many of the young people who go from um, 16 to 17 moving to a, a level they've not they've not been encouraged to be very creative with language to work with poetry to work with song to work with longer text and it does create like a confidence around that so i think it is a big leap because the a levels are um probably like circa 1980 in terms of university entrance but the gcsc of course um is based now probably one and a half two hours a week of, of french classes whereas when i was doing french it would have been four or five hours a week so the young people are, i happen to do a gcsc depending it's in the state sector on far reduced hours compared to previous years and we know for example that um off call um, is ba basically its benchmark assessment of languages on a model from 2009 which is a model obviously that relates to a very different context for teaching a language where there was far, far more access to the classroom far more face-to-face -face teaching so we have got um, a system that is that is that is boncal, that is wonky in the sense of the aspirations are from models of languages that are fluency focused the teaching time isn't sufficient and therefore the bridge between GCSE and A-level is probably a bridge too far just because they are not well connected. So I, I'm lobbying very hard as a language activist to try and get a, a, a review or rethink or reconceptualization of what we expect at GCSE and what we can hope for at A-level and, and to look for a much more uh, creative project driven by love of language and culture rather than fluency and accuracy. 
I, I recognise I'm not in the majority with this, with this, with the UK government. The Welsh government, yes, there's a strong interest in multilingualism, the bilingual agenda. The UK government um, is not in as interested in that uh, that approach, and they are certainly um, the people that advise them are on the grammar phonics vocabulary bent, and that's that, and that is causing um, massive logjam and frustration amongst the teacher community. Excellent. Thank you, Claire. Now, this is when it, 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 we've got a few minutes left, so we can have a kind of free for all. Usually the chair gets to abuse his or her position, and, and I will no doubt do that. But uh, we there was an offer to come back. I, Chris, did you want to come back or does anybody want to make a, a point or raise a question? Um, I can see I can see the list of attendees. I know who you are. You can ask it in the Q&A or you can ask it viva voce, but I think you need to raise your hand so that I give you right. So Chris, you're raising your hand and I'm now allowing you to talk. Okay. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Excellent. The technology works, Gordon. Congratulations. Can you believe it? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I just thought I'd come back before sort of going to Andrew sort of coming back to me, just to sort of build on what Claire was saying further. I think a further, issue sometimes with the language is just how wide an A star is. Um, my daughter's doing French A level, um, my son's at the GCSE stage, but my daughter has changed from a local school to now being in a private school in England and the realisation that it doesn't matter if you've got an A star, because A star, I mean you can almost fail in terms of getting less than 50 percent you can almost get more wrong than you got right and still be close to an a star at gcse level but when you go into a group with people where the pass mark within the school is considered to be 90 percent, it's such a huge divide to get across and i think even at the local schools people targeting a star just feel it's it's, it's that it's a massive jump from an a star gcse to an a star a level um, and I think there are a lot of issues in there. And I, going back to the point, I think we've, there's a lot of common ground between us in terms of the desire to learn about country um, rather than focus on linguistic ability. But I think some of this, and I think I've spoken about this in the past, is we almost need a GCSE, a subject which almost tricks people into wanting to learn languages by having the focus on cultural issues without even initially any linguistic side at all, but hopefully getting to a point where the children themselves will think, actually, I want to go even further than this. Let me learn a language. I feel as though that's kind of where we need to get to. I think this, until we sort of down the line by about a decade and got past this image of languages being difficult, we almost, as I said, need to fool and trick people into doing the languages through the back door as well. Coming back to Andrew, I think, one of the issues here is that Japanese has been developed differently. Um, this isn't about better or worse, it's just because of its evolution, it has been very different in that, I mean, Sheffield really was the model. I mean, the Cardiff system was based on Sheffield and a group of about six universities all established Japanese departments in the late ages at the same time as Cardiff. And I think one of the things that we see of this is the big division in, Japan, in Japanese departments historically between Japanese studies and Japanese language. And in fact, we still have today two separate associations. There's a British Association for Japanese Studies and the British Association for Teachers of Japanese with their two slightly different focuses. Um, just by chance, the head of both of those associations, we're both at Cardiff University at the moment, which has an opportunity for us to work closer together. Um, but I think there's inherently been a different attitude. And I think because of the slightly, I mean, building what Joey has talked about, colonialization and so on. Obviously, Japan did have its colonies, but it's very different to what we talk about with French, British, Spanish, and so on colonies. And I think that also makes a difference in terms of how Japan can be studied. Its interaction with the UK, with Europe, is very different to many other parts of the world. But I think inherently there are differences, but I found it interesting in your talk where you sort of jumped from the talking about what it used to be like sort of around the war and America and so on, to then talking about China and the desire for study in China, which kind of skipped over actually the China model was very much based on the what had happened with Japanese. And of course, many departments, schools which had, or universities which had Japanese 
went on to also establish Chinese and even Korean. In fact, Sheffield, when I was there, was the biggest Japanese department in the whole of Europe. And now they, I believe they recruit more students in Korean um, than they do in Japanese because Koreans found through boom. So I think there are certain things. But just finally, just to point out, even at Cardiff, we have a Japanese program within our school, of course, but there are actually as many researchers dealing with Japan outside of our school as there are within the school. And I, so I think there's always going to be inherently within structures complications with how we all map together. Sorry, that was very long. Okay, that's fine. Sorry, I've just muted you actually, or I've asked you to unmute. So thank you, Chris. Um, Andrew or Claire, the, the, I think it was more Andrew than Claire, but either of you, do you wish to come back on that? Andrew? Just really briefly to note, yeah, yeah I mean, absolutely right that, um, you know, Japan was seen as the, uh, the challenging power to the United States in the 1980s, of course. And so the focus, of course, was on Japanese studies as a growth area. And, and yeah, I, I did admit that, but you're, you're right to um, point that out, really. That's all to, to just note on my part. OK, so thank you for that. Now, I, I've got my question to ask. I've always got to keep a question in your back pocket. Uh, but um, does anybody have... Uh, I'm, be, I'm delighted to have other questions. I can see there's, we're still quite numerous here. If you want to ask a live question, you've got to work out how to raise your hand and you will be allowed to, but believe me, nobody's going to prevent you. Um, no, nobody's, nobody's, nobody's twitching or itching to get at it. Okay, well, maybe I'll ask my question quite quickly. Um, and I mean, I, I've learned a lot today actually. And it occurred to me, I was taking notes, and it occurred to me that um, area studies is, is doing better in some parts of, a world, of the world than others, just as languages uh, and language teaching is doing better in some parts of the world uh, than others. And a few solutions appear to have um, emerged today as to how to, if you like, revive uh, area studies. Now, one of them and this is a term which has come up is activism. Quite a few people have mentioned that term amongst the speaker speakers. Another seems to be collaboration, particularly of, a, of an interdisciplinary nature. One of the things that wasn't mentioned, and I do think it might be one of the ways out of the problems that area studies face, is theory. In other words, the development of, of conceptual frameworks and so on, which give... Uh, more depth to area studies and language uh, studies as well. Um, to the collaboration probably includes co probably comparative studies. So that's another way of extending the depth uh, ex uh, of, and the breadth of area studies. So let's then take the last idea, which is the idea of decolonizing area studies. Now, what I wonder about is to what extent is decolonizing area studies a way out of, if you like, the challenges that the area studies face? And to what extent does it actually end up presenting a new set of challenges? Because what, jo what Joey was mentioning in a very tactful way is that when you go down the decolonizing route, you have to engage much more and listen much more. And it's a much longer, uh, and slower process over which you have less control. And in addition to that, if you take uh, Claire's analogy with uh, you know, English no longer being the default language, well, that also creates other problems. So, so I suppose my question is, um, does anybody have any comments on what I've said? And also to what extent do you think decolonizing areas to these is the way forward? And to what, do you to what extent do you think, no, it's a trap. So um, anybody in any order, feel free to, to answer that. Well, I think, I think a lot of it, just go to the first question, depends on what you mean by decolonizing, doesn't it really? So, mm. you know, what, what I've said in my talk there was it made me realize that even within the UK, you know, mm. you could talk about colonial mindsets. Yes. I'm obviously, I'm from London, I'm from Italian, from an Anglo-Italian background, but living here in Wales, I've realised how far many people believe there to be, you know, internal colonisation and, and internal discrimination and, and, and uh, um, misappropriation, misinterpretation. So I, th I think when, if you go to almost like the, the micro, the micro level, the decolonial mindset is, is about moving away from homogenising narratives, you know, acknowledging uneven power relationships, and thinking much more carefully about history 
um, as a productive element of the present. So I, I, I think that's I think that's mandatory for all researchers, and I think that the decolonizing agenda, you know, it has that appellation that term now. It's a it's a it's a healthy and sane reflection on why. I mean, at, at the moment, I feel that we're living a moment, right? I think we've always lived a moment, but I feel I feel that I am now living in a seismic moment in world history. Now, I should have thought that before. But I didn't. But I've been I've been obliged to reflect with Brexit and coronavirus what I'm living in now. Let me realise how unself-aware I was before about how where I was living, and I think almost all researchers who have an ethical stance will be thinking that at the moment. Well, that's so, so, so for me, the de decolonising is a manifestation of reflecting that you're uh, what is the time of the now, um, and, and being critical about that. That's excellent. Who, who would like a, another crack at this whip? Uh, Andrew, Joey? You're both, I think you're both on mute. Actually. Oh, I'm not actually, I'm just not. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, I mean, I think that's absolutely right, Claire. And what you said um, is basically yeah, about the the past and the being in the present is basically what Kusikanki is trying to say, uh, well, is, is, is saying. Um, um, yeah, I mean, I do think that really, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a very difficult um, and almost sort of impossible for us in our positions to to become decolonial, really, because I think it is about ceding space and ceding um, voice and, you know, um, trying to undo the hegemon that we are kind of in, <laughs> um, which, you know, it, it, we're only going to be able to do in, in very limited ways without really quite fundamental changes. Mm. Um, but, you know, it's something that I think we should be working towards, really. Good. Thank you for that, Joey. Hey, Andrew? Yeah, I mean, really kind of echoing um, what Claire was saying. I mean, we're, we're certainly, if you want, living in interesting times. And I think um, as, as scholars and as participants in these debates, it's a great opportunity to to reintegrate, reinterrogate rather, reinterrogate our disciplines, our the the histories of those disciplines, and and take them forward in new directions because we are living in a moment of incredible fluidity and change. And if academics can't provide insight into those changes, I, I don't know who can. So so I think it provides an excellent opportunity actually for area studies, broadly defined and um, considered. Um, in the discussion today to, to, to really put itself out there on the map as, as, a, as an area, as a discipline, or as a, as a focus that can really provide useful insights, uh, you know, not just within the university, but, but beyond that, not just within the academy, but outside the academy too. Excellent, thank you, Andrew. And uh, now, uh, the time that I said, I said quarter past one, uh, I can tell you it's, it's 18 minutes, uh, sorry, quarter past two, it's 18 minutes past. So effectively, we have covered uh, the ground that we wanted to, but there is time for one last question. If anybody has got a final question to either write or to uh, yeah, give you five or six seconds to do so. Anybody coming up, anybody want to raise their hand? Okay, you're all being, yes. There's also time for one last comment from the panel. Yeah, just Andrew. really just me. Um, I didn't actually, um, I, don't, I don't think I mentioned it. I can't remember if I did or not, but um, just the, the point that there are still some academic disciplines out there that, um, that produce theoretical models or, or theoretical insights without linguistic knowledge of their region or area of study. And I don't know if anybody has any observations where you think that's even possible. Can you do that? Um, that, that's something that I suppose I'm interested in hearing any, anybody who thinks that is actually, it is possible to do that. I would only say one thing about that. I, I think when we start talking about decolonizing uh, area studies or any other topic, we do tend to, to look at it often from the perspective of what do we teach either at school or at university or whatever else. And there is sometimes less of a focus on how do we do things as policymakers? You know, uh, and so there tends to be a, a there tends to be a you know a failure sometimes to understand the other society and the. I mean, my an example I would give of that is I remember going to the Democratic Republic of Congo, 
And the first thing I learned when I got there, well, apart from the fact that it's an incredibly dangerous country and don't go there because you'll need to fill in all kinds of ethical uh, forms and other forms before getting there. But the first thing I learned was the, the British aid agency, which was there, was, which was also the biggest donor to the country. Um, 70% of the people working there did not speak a word of French. And not only that, almost nobody ever left the compound, you know? So when we think about decolonizing the way we teach things, I do think we also need to think about decolonizing the way we do things. And, and I think you're right, as a researcher, um, not knowing the language can be one of the big weaknesses in a lot of political science research. They do a really broad, cross-national comparative study, which doesn't really have any understanding of the smaller, small end case that is buried within that. And that can be an issue. Uh, does anybody, so um, I don't want to sort of start uh, pontificating or whatever. Uh, any last comments from uh, Claire I'm or Joey? There's no such thing as language blind research. Good. There's no such Good. thing as language neutral research. That's absolute rubbish. Every, the language through which you conduct understand, interpret your findings is always hedged with cultural assumptions and connotations. So, and, and particularly in the field that you're talking about, um, I, know, I, know that, I know that in our, our colleague who's now left Loredana, we, we truly talk about colleagues applying for, for um, research grants with one particular funder. I have make no consideration of language when they wanted to go and work in Namibia or Uganda or Eritrea. I mean, you know, so, so I, I, think, I think it's endemic to particularly Anglophone academics and in, unless they're in modern languages often an inability to concept to concept that their research is linguistically is is, is language rich and, and and that language must be considered in the way that it's conceived constructed and delivered um so you know again, again our, our colleague hillary footer you know who works in reading on ngos and listening zones talks about how many of the, those in the aid sector you know, um, their work has been compromised by being unable to speak the languages of the countries in which they work and therefore misunderstand the cultural assumptions and the cultural mores and frameworks through which that those projects are meant to deliver. So I, I think, I think you know, that there's no such thing as a place where it's okay to only speak English. But I, I fear that a lot of our colleagues have been inducted and trained academically to believe that is the case or not to, or to make the assumption and not question it. Excellent, thank you, Peter. Uh, Joey, any last word? Um, I don't think so. No. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, that's uh, probably uh, well worth saying. Um, yeah. Right. Just a, Well, actually, one thing which I didn't touch on at all, which I think would be good to come back to in a future discussion, is the idea of creative research, actually, because that is something which yes. I'm also developing and I would like to talk to Claire about more. So put that in as a put a pin in that for yes i think that is important that was i did write that down as a question to claire did, did you want to just say one word about that claire as a kind of appetizer or a, a creative methods i'll, I'll say two research? words i'll say two words do it yes <laughs> but my question will was actually how do you do it what does it involve because i'm always interested in new methods and new approaches I, I, again again I, I, unfortunately our colleague our colleague ellen Affon, our, my phd student who, who really you know really opened my eyes to the value of creative research methods you know is no longer in the room but effectively it's, it's about it's about co-working co-designing i mean you're doing it already joey co-working co-designing with 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 Colleagues with whom, with people with whom you want to interact. So rather than imposing a model and saying, answer my questionnaire, answer my survey, do it in 250 words, it's about co designing and actually working together as active participants in the same workshop together to produce things together that aren't just your research article. In fact, your research article is just a byproduct. Yeah. It's about relationship building. And often, if you work in the languages, you can come up a lot with very creative materials. Again, what you saw there, that visual image that I showed you, mm -hmm. that was produced by graphic. Um, facilitator who drew a who drew a two-day workshop we didn't do a report we drew it we drew a two-day workshop as outcomes for the funder and as outcomes that we've now used and that, that that's a jpeg of one part of a much much bigger picture that she drew of our two-day workshop in oxford so i think there, there are ways to report capture collate produce that aren't putting down words on a page for 25 people that read your article in a esoteric journal um, so that, that's what it is. And it's about reporting back to funders on the impact of that research on people that you work with. So I think, you know, again, I'm happy to, I mean, I'm sure Ellen and, and Era would come and talk about it as well. I'm happy to talk about what we've done. But we work with young people and they're innately open to creative methods, you know. But even so, it doesn't, it doesn't in no way, um, uh, you know, disallow an approach with colleagues in different areas. Which I think actually often opens up 
perspectives, voices of people that would be uncomfortable putting down in words. A lot of people aren't happy writing things down, but they're very happy to talk and draw something or represent something in a different way um, and work together rather than you telling them what to do. So I think it's, it's much more it's the approach and it's, it's, the, it's the materials that you might use to go about doing it. Thanks, Claire. That's really helpful. Uh, I, that's really what I wanted to know. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Listen, I, I think I'll have to close it now. Uh, I'm really grateful to the speakers. Thank you so much for taking the time. It's such a busy point in the calendar. Thanks also to all the attendees, many of whom are still here, and I'm very grateful. Thanks to Ellery again for setting it up and Elena for co-hosting couple of things coming up on Wednesday the 4th of November, which is not far away actually at one o'clock from Professor Ambrina, Ambrina Manji will be doing a lecture on decolonizing area studies and focusing on funding bodies and the, the bodies that give us the money that we use to do research. And that will be fascinating. So please do turn up to that. And then on Wednesday the 9th of December, uh, Elena and Catherine Williams will give talks, which are essentially methods papers, one on interviewing in a digital world and the other is on conducting feminist research with anti-feminist subjects. So really quite a fascinating uh, schedule ahead of us. I'm going to shut down the uh, recording. I've probably forgotten to do something really vital, but I'm going to shut it down and just thank everybody. Elena, if you could hang around for one second, I'd be grateful, but thank you very much. I'm stopping the recording and everybody's free to go. Bye-bye, okay, thank you. <laughs>